Hello and welcome to Tarim Talks. I'm your host, Bob Rilchi. Uh, first of all, I want to say Happy New Year. It's 2022, so I hope everyone's having a great start to the new year and we'll have more great things to come. Uh, today, I'm with Subi Imam, the owner of T6 Prints and the launcher of the recently created Atlas Hoodie Project. If you ordered it, you should have it by now. If not, Subi is the man to complain to. I recently got mine. It uh, took a long time to get here. I ordered it in Calgary, and then I moved, and then it came to Calgary, and then my sister brought it to Istanbul to give it to me. So it's had a long, <laughs> long, long journey, but I'm wearing it right now as I'm speaking to you. Uh, welcome, Subi. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad to hear that your hoodie went through such a worldwide tour. It's, uh, that's, that's good to hear. Should put a couple of stickers on it from all the airports that it's been to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, Subi, why don't you tell us, uh, just in your own words, what you do and who you are? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Subi. I, I'm, I live in Toronto. Um, I'm the owner and operator of The Six Prints um, mm -hmm. here in Toronto. And basically, what we do is we create... Um, custom apparel for all kinds of different brands. Um, and we help them start on their journey or we help them grow their brand into uh, the next level. And we offer like different types of printing services like screen printing and embroidery, um, custom labeling, packaging, all that stuff. Um, yeah, aside from that, I've, I've been trying to slowly work on like personal projects because for the last you know ever since i started the six prints it's always been creating for other people and for other people's brands um and lately i've been trying to sort of focus on my own thing and create my own pieces and the atlas hoodie was like the first step towards that yeah i mean what got you what got you started into into this uh printing business in the first place <clears throat> Um, it was like, I've always been into the arts and I've always been into fashion. Um, I've always been into creating physical pieces that I could touch and feel. Um, but you know, my, my parents always kind of, uh, push me towards and, you know, the typical immigrant family type of thing where they push you towards, you know, medicine and engineering. Um, so in the beginning, I studied life sciences, and then I, I left that, and then I studied um, civil engineering. But those were not really things that I wanted to do um, all that much. And while I was studying, um, I had, you know, I had like design ideas. I wanted to create my own brand at the time, and um, I wanted to make some shirts, and I wanted to make some hoodies, and. You know, it was just getting really expensive to get other people to print for me. And um, that was when I was really researching on how to um, how to print stuff, how to get stuff onto T-shirts and how to get stuff onto hoodies. And then I got super nerdy about it. And then I, I, I just deep dived into it, learned about screen printing, um, got my first, you know, I started with like a heat press and a vinyl cutter. Um, that was my starting point. And then later on, I, I got like a screen printing press. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's just been a, it, it was never meant to be um, a print shop where I was creating stuff for other people. It was always meant to be, I want to create stuff for myself. And I just didn't want to pay other people to create it because I just didn't want to give up that control. And I also just didn't have the money to be able to just constantly spend um, on other people to create stuff for me. So, but then when you get into screen printing, it's it's very tough to learn, and you know you waste a lot of material. A lot of ink is wasted trying to learn. A lot of shirts are wasted, and so you need money, right? You need resources. I was a student. Um, I didn't have a whole lot of money. So, and the only way to kind of raise money is to, now that I kind of know how to print is to be able to sort of offer that service to other people. 
and print stuff for them, print shirts for them. And I was printing shirts for like events and weddings and all types of stuff so that I could use that money and sort of fund my own thing. But then I got really busy with printing for other people and then it just became the six prints and it just became a print shop. And then slowly I sort of forgot the brand that I was trying to create. Um, yeah, it's pretty much how it kind of got started. So kind of um, addressing addressing a need of your own and it kind of grew into something bigger, into what it is today. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, so tell me a little bit about uh, the Atlas Hoodie Project. I, I mean, I know it's been um, a few months now and people hopefully have received their hoodies if they ordered it. Yeah. Uh, tell us about this project and the inspiration for it. I think, yeah, I think by now, I hope everyone got it. I, I haven't had any emails about anyone saying that they haven't gotten their order. Um, but yeah, for me, you know, that was, um, it, it really wasn't something that, you know, it, this wasn't like a personal project. It was more, I wanted to do this for uh, a charity. And we, in Toronto, we had recently, the community here, uh, we recently purchased a, a church and uh, it's a really big church. I think it's over 4,000 square feet. And we used to have our own uh, mosque in, um, and it was like sort of in an office plaza. And I think it was about maybe 1,000 or 1,500 square feet. Uh, and that's where we held all types of events. Uh, you know, uh, that's where we had uh, language classes for kids. And that's where we went to for Eid prayer. That's where we went to if someone's, you know, parents died and we had to, you know, do all that stuff. So it was, that was like the place that was at the community hub for the Uyghurs in Toronto. And recently we purchased a church to convert that into a mosque. And so just the expense of that and purchasing something that big. And then on top of that, having to renovate it, you know, make all these, put these new floors, paint the walls, all kinds of stuff. Um, and I wanted to help with that in a way that I could. Um, and the only way that I knew was like, uh, you know, I wanted to sort of combine my passion with this charity aspect. And um, I just wanted to create a piece that I, I thought everybody would love. And at the same time, I wanted to raise money for this mosque. Um, and one of my goals is to, you know, create when it comes to um, fashion and, and wearable pieces i want to create pieces that you know that are inspired by things that you find in your home you know in a typical Uyghur home things that that's part of our culture that you could you know not just experience it at your home but you could sort of take it outside with you and go to the mall and, and you know like wear it on your body um and so i i sort of came up with the deathless hoodie design and, you know, I never expected it to be what it was. I, I think, you know, the, the factory that I was working with, um, their minimum was 200 pieces. Like if it was less than 200, they wouldn't make it. Um, and so I was really nervous when I launched it because I didn't know if I could get orders for 200. Um, but when I launched it, you know, at the end, we... <clears throat> We sold like um, 400 hoodies and uh, it was like double the, the expectation. And I was blown away by it. It was, it was a crazy experience. Um, it, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work. It, it took a lot of work to do it. But at the end of the day, when the hoodies came in from the factory and I called all my friends over and we spent the whole day packing and shipping and you know, packing and shipping 400 hoodies to individual addresses. And it was just rough. Well, like, you know, a lot of them, uh, you know, a lot of guys, a lot of my friends um, helped out with the bulk orders. Um, uh, I think, you know, you organized the, the Calgary orders, I believe. Yeah, um, I think we had about 12 then, in Calgary. Yeah. And then, you know, Minavad and, and Tatum, they did the Boston and then, um, Subi and Adila in, uh, in Australia, they did like collectively, they did like a hundred hoodies. Uh, 
So I had a lot of help in that regard in, you know, because the bulk order really helped with shipping because to ship one hoodie to Australia was like $60 per hoodie. And I was charging 65 for the hoodie. So it was crazy to just pay the, you know, the exact same price for shipping. Um, but when they bought in bulk and, and they just handed them out, it was like, it worked out to be like less than 10 bucks per shipping. So, um, all in all, it was a really good experience and I learned a lot and, you know, it, it made me feel good to be able to help, uh, with the local causes that I care about. Yeah. And, and I mean, just beyond the community aspect of it, I think, especially online, uh, it really took a hold of the Uyghur diaspora. You know, people were kind of going crazy about it. And I mean, justifiably so. This design is amazing. And I I like to just rub the Atlas stripe on the arm every <laughs> once in a while because it's just so it's so different as a texture from the rest yeah. of the hoodie. Um, yeah, that one I mean, was a difficult thing to the the polyester, the because we you know you want to it's Atlas is like actual silk, right? Yeah. Um, but to put silk in a hoodie that and like real authentic silk, the price of the hoodie would have just been crazy. And also, like Islamically, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not sure if this is correct, but I'm uh, uh, men aren't allowed to wear silk. Um, so, you know, the finding a solution for that and being able to um, mass produce the same type of feel of atlas and same type of uh, pattern was sort of the biggest challenge in trying to get this done. Yeah. So that's why you settled on the, the polyester fabrics to, uh, yeah. 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 So I want to go back just a little bit. So, you know, you were talking about your interactions with the Uyghur community in Toronto, Toronto, mm -hmm. as some Toronto. people would say. <laughs> <laughs> so t tell me a little bit more about that, the, your relationship to the Uyghur community there. Um, my relationship to the Uyghur community here is that I, you know, I'm, I'm in and out, you know, like there are things that I show up for things that I care about. I show up for, and I, I, I like to be a bit more involved. Um, uh, but sometimes I'm not always there, you know, and, and ever since I started my business, I've been sort of living in my own world where I'm just at work all the time and, you know, starting a business, it's like it, you think about it 24 seven and it's hard to spare time to be more involved in the community. But uh, nowadays I'm, I'm trying to be more and more involved. Um, you know, I, I show up where I can to protests and to events and, uh, to the mosque if they need help with anything. Um, I've been going to, uh, um, the Tar lessons in Mississauga. Um, we have, um, um, we have something, uh, it's Anatol Mehtep in Mississauga, which is where they teach, uh, language classes to, to kids, um, at a high school. Um, it's really dope. So a lot of people send their kids there. Um, but they were having, um, the Tar classes and I've been going there like here and there. Um, the only problem is like these classes are for kids. And so right. I'm in there, I'm like the only adult and everyone else is like six or seven years old. And I'm just there strumming away. And um, it's a bit awkward. And, you know, I haven't gone because of that, to be honest with you, because it's like, you know, when, when you're at my age, you kind of learn a little bit faster than some of these kids. And, you know, they kind of slow you down a little bit. But Right now, what I've been trying to do is organize um, the, the Uyghur youth, like people around my age who are interested in learning uh, Duttar and um, scheduling like an uh, adult class, something that's more focused on the, the older kids. Um, and I've had a, a lot of interest and I'm, I'm sort of trying to 
get a collection of names and figure out um, how many people we can have in a classroom with COVID and all that. And then just figure out like the cost, um, the figure out the logistics of, you know, having the dars for everybody. Uh, a lot of people might have to bring their own. But right now, that's the thing that I've been working on with the community is to try and sort of organize that. Um, but hopefully that, you know, that falls into place because I've been really meaning to to learn this instrument. I'm, I'm in love with it. And it's really difficult to learn when you don't have the resources um, readily available to you. You know, you know, you could learn a lot on YouTube. Like if you want to learn how to play the guitar, there's lots of the tutorials, but not for yeah. the guitar, right? Exactly. Um, and we have an excellent teacher here. And um, yeah, just want to create, I think, something for the adults. That's the That's the next goal. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Um, it's really comes down to that fine motor control, right? Kids, mm -hmm. kids don't got it as much as uh, you or I do. Yeah, yeah and, and you know what? They're not even interested. That's the thing. It's like they don't even care. Their parents make them go there. Uh, and like they're, they're there just to clock in, clock out. Um, they're not really interested in learning all too much. Yeah, but that that's a pretty standard like... Yeah, Asian parent, Uyghur parent, kind of thing to do. I mean, my parents made me play piano as a kid, and um, oh yeah, I don't, I don't remember any of it. You know, I played, did you, I played for a while. Did you and enjoy just, it, or you know, it was, uh, it was fun at first, mm -hmm. but then, uh, do you know the whole Royal Conservatory of Music program? No, it's I this, don't. It's a strict examination level based kind of stuff, and it just gave me so much anxiety that I hated the piano by the end of it. Like I just didn't want to even look at this thing because the exams would make me nervous. My hands were shaking before and I couldn't play the piece I, I memorized yeah. because my hands were shaking. And I was just like, I'm done with this. I can't, I can't do it anymore. You know, that's crazy. My parents did that to me with hockey. Oh yeah. I, yeah. They're like, you know, we're Canadians now. You got to, you got to assimilate and learn their national sport. And I played hockey and I think when I was like 10, 11, 12, and I hated it. It was the worst thing. Like not only was it violent, I got into a few fights, uh, but um, it was like a very strenuous amount of training for very little time on the actual ice playing mm. the game. Like, you know, we would spend like, five hours training and play for like 30 minutes um, yeah and then you have all that equipment on you you've got your knee pads your shin pads all you know it's just so much heavy equipment and then you, you sweat it out and then all your equipment smells like garbage and then you gotta wash them and yeah it was just a nightmare i didn't like it well that's what it's about yeah being a hooser <laughs> exactly yeah but it did teach me how to skate, so I'm I'm happy about that because when you got all that equipment, you're not afraid of falling, right? So taught me yeah. how to skate pretty well. That's true. I I took uh, skating lessons. Didn't didn't do hockey, but oh yeah, I, f I feel like you learn a few more advanced tactics or techniques in in hockey or like you know playing hockey than you would regularly yeah. ice skating. You do, and you're you're more willing to take risks because the fall you don't even feel it. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, right. So you were saying that you're kind of you're kind of in and out of the Uyghur community in, um, mm -hmm. in Toronto. You know, you're you're a busy guy. You've got stuff to do. Uh, so what what I want to ask is not particularly like your relationship to the community, but what do you think of the the growing diaspora of Uyghurs in in Toronto in Canada? You know worldwide like where do you where do you see yourself belonging at, as a whole um you know i'm uh, overall you know um looking at my friend group and the people i know i'm, I'm fairly happy with the diaspora i think uh, at least people in my circle they they really do a lot you know for you know, for, for furthering our cause and everything. Um, 
I put myself sort of in the background. You know, I'm, I'm not really out there too much, but I do things in the background where I can support in the best way that I can. And a lot of times, um, the things that I might do uh, might be a bit more self-serving. And, and, you know, like, for example, the Atlassities, um, you know, yes, it had a charity in, uh, aspect to it, but it was sort of a piece that I always wanted to create, you know. Um, and it, 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 it sort of killed two birds with one stone. And so sometimes, like, in, in, and even for, you know, the Totem Network, sometimes I do, like, graphic design work. Um, and when it comes time to, for protests in, in the city, um, I'll print shirts for them and, and whatnot. And, uh, so I, I try to stay involved in that way, but I'm not always like actively out there to, to be that involved in, in, in the, in the Uyghur community. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. No, that's totally fair. Yeah. Um, you know, beyond, beyond just the, the activism cause of it all, you know, um, maybe, a a bigger question is what does it mean to be Uyghur for you? Uh, you're going to hate this answer. Let's hear it. <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's, you know, and I think, um, last time we had a discussion, yeah, I, 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 I've been trying to think about this question, but I, I really don't know the answer to it, at least not yet. I think I'm still sort of in the discovery mode of what I feel, um, what I think being Uyghur means, especially because I'm, um, I was born in Watan and I, you know, I left at an early age, so. Uh, I, I did get to experience, you know, both worlds, but I, I grew up here for most of my life. And uh, it's hard for me to answer that question because I, I just really don't know uh, what it means to be, to be Uyghur for me. I, I really don't know at this point in my life. Maybe I'll, I'll you know, I'll discover uh, as I go along and as I, uh, as I grow, but yeah, at the moment, I just, I just really don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's totally fair. It's, it's a big, complex question of identity. So it's mm -hmm. not something that you would take lightly. And I'm sure you, you pick up pieces along the way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's fair. All right, let's, let's shift to fashion. So you were saying, you know, fashion is something that something of a passion of yours. Um, it's an expression of who you are and that you were with the Atlas hoodie, you were looking at ways to incorporate like what's around you, you know, culturally uh, into the, into fashion. So that's how you came up with the idea mm -hmm. of Atlas hoodie. And I believe you have a, a new project coming up. Yeah, I have, um, I'm making bucket hats. Um, and this one is going to be more of um, a personal project. Like the last Deathless was for a charity, but this one is just going to be, uh, you got to buy it if you think it's cool and you want to, you know, support the brand type of thing. Um, and this one is going to be more inspired by, um, it, it'll be like a Gilem inspired project. So uh, mm -hmm. different types of rugs. I'm, I'm just experimenting with different types of rug patterns that I could and uh, it sort of encased the, the bucket hat with. Um, and right now for this, I'm, you know, the Deathless Hoodies was made in Pakistan um, to, you know, make it more affordable. Um, and it, I just didn't have the capabilities to be able to sew together a hoodie like that, or it, I couldn't find really manufacturers here that could do it. Uh, and at the same time, I didn't want to charge you know, extremely high prices for them. But the bucket right. hats, I'm going to be making them here in Toronto, um, right down to, you know, making the the fabric itself, cutting it, creating the wow. pattern, um, sewing it, everything is going to be done here in Toronto. And um, this is going to be 
sort of the beginning of a brand that I'm launching and, and the brand will be focused more on um, headwear like hats and, and bucket hats. That's going to be the primary focus. Um, and, you know, right now I'm in the stage of just researching um, different types of material that I can use to sort of emulate the same type of feel that you would feel if you touched Gilem, but at the same time, you know, you don't want it super thick. Um, you know, you just want yeah. sort of that texture. You don't really want the thickness of it because then it's too hot to wear. Right. Um, so right now it's just been, you know, the biggest challenge right now is just finding the fabric and finding the correct way to print that pattern onto that piece of fabric because you know, the real challenge is like, how do I avoid China? Uh, you know, right. If, like if you go to China, if you get your fabric supplied from China, they could do the printing for you and get it all ready. Like they have the resources, but the real challenge for me, has just been finding companies here that could do it or companies in other countries other than China that could do it. Um, but, uh, that's the biggest challenge. I feel like if I can at least overcome that hurdle, everything else will fall into place because I already have, you know, connections here that could sew the hat for me. The The real challenge is just sourcing the, the correct fabric. Um, but this is going to be coming out hopefully for summer. Okay. So that's coming up. I mean, five, six months from now. Um, mm -hmm. So with the, with the printing, I guess it would be too cost prohibitive or, or impractical to have patterns weaved into the, the fabric of the hat, like actual gilem. Yeah. Like you, you could do that, but that would be very expensive. Um, right. Um, like that is something, if I want to keep the cost down, I'd have to do overseas. Um, whereas if, um, if I print it, um, I could source the fabric you know, and I could just do the print myself. Um, that would be, you know, that would allow me a lot more control. And then I'd have, I'd have more knowledge about where the, the fabric or where the, the labor and everything is coming from. Do you know what I mean? Because I'm controlling everything. Right. Um, like right now, the, the method that I'm exploring the most is sublimation. Um, sublimation is a, is a, a method of printing that uses steam and it, it literally heats up the ink to a certain temperature and it turns into steam and it gets absorbed into the fabric and it becomes part of the fabric. Um, but sublimation only works with hundred percent polyester. Um, and so right now the, the goal is to find hundred percent polyester fabric that feels sort of like Gilem. And the thing that's the closest, I guess, is corduroy. Um, corduroy right. has that sort of felt like texture to it that uh, kind of emulates the feel of Kilem. Um, but the challenge is like finding 100% polyester corduroy. And most of the corduroy that's out there is 100% cotton. Um, so just finding a polyester alternative uh, they do exist. It's just a matter of finding them uh, from a source that's not in in, uh, in China. Uh, that's the ideal sort of plan is to get the fabric and then sublimate it here in Canada, cut it and then sew it. Um, and, you know, if it really comes down to it, then, you know, like you said, it, it, it is possible to weave, but it's such an intricate design that it'll be very expensive. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, you, you probably want to make it, you know, more accessible to people than, uh, yeah. Yeah. High fashion. yeah. That's the other thing for me is like, yeah, yeah. You know, that's the other thing for me. Like I want to make sure that it's affordable. Um, it's not going to be cheap by any means because, you know, we, I am making this in Toronto where people are getting, you know, fair wages and it's going to be very high quality. Um, but at the same time, I don't want it to be so crazy expensive that people can't afford it. I want everybody, for me, the most important thing is just seeing people wear the stuff that I make. And, you know, like seeing you 
wear that less hoodie or seeing people, you know, in the street where sometimes I go, I'll go to a restaurant and I'll randomly bump into someone who's wearing an atlas hoodie and it's like the greatest feeling in the world. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I can imagine. That's, that's what know, I want at the end of the day. It's something, something that came out of your brain and now people are putting it on their bodies. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. It's like I touched each and every one of you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, <laughs> with your uh, head, headwear designs, uh, do you have any other plans uh, like beyond the bucket hats? Is this all kind of wheel or themed stuff or is it just this is just the launch of it and you're, you're going to take it where it goes from there? I, I'm going to take it. Um, it won't all be like or themed. Um, but it'll be, um, in the beginning, it'll be mostly focused on, on hats. Um, and I'm taking it real slow. Like, you know, I, I, I space out the sort of creations just because, you know, I, I do have a business and it's really challenging at the moment to even try to do the R and D for all of these like different fabrics and the bucket hats and finding suppliers that can give me the right fabric, finding people, manufacturers that can sew it for me. And um, so at the moment, it's, it's, it's hard for me to focus all my attention on, on, on the brand. But ultimately, my goal is, is exactly that. I want to be able to do, you know, dedicate 100% of my time to something that I create versus um, the six prints is very temporary. Um, it's not something that I plan to do for a long period of time, or at least not be involved in it for a long period of time. Uh, because my ultimate goal and the thing that I've always wanted to do was just, you know, create my own pieces and create my own designs. Um, and, you know, the Six Prince has been a very good, um, like a learning uh, experience in that now I know a lot more information than I did three, four years ago. I know a lot of the different printing techniques. Um, I know where to source material and I know how to, I have experience dealing with brands and how they sell their products and how they market it. And um, so I've gained all of this knowledge and it's been really good for that, but it's not, uh, the six prints was never really something that I envisioned to be long-term. Uh, it was very temporary. Right. So, I mean, soon enough, you're, you're out of the game, the printing mm -hmm. game that it is. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll either be out of it completely or I will, you know, I'm trying to grow the business into a place where I can extract myself from it and I don't have to be so involved with the day-to-day -day operations. Oh, right. Right. Okay. That makes sense. So, um, then this opens up. The question you mentioned it before, of course, but I want to talk about what what is your passion for fashion? Oh, that rhymes. I'm a look at that. I'm a poet. <laughs> like bars. Where does it come from? <laughs> um, when did you realize that that's what you really want to be doing? And you know what what speaks to you about the world of fashion? I think for me, like it's just a. Um, uh, it's not like just about fashion. It was always more about just creating physical pieces that I could, um, you know, that I could sort of see out in the world and uh, either people see it or they experience it or they wear it on their body. And for me, you know, one of the reasons why I studied civil engineering was, you know, it was half like, my parents kind of pushed me into it and half like I kind of did enjoy studying it because it was, I wanted to get into, um, you know, uh, building things in, in a sense. And, and, you know, you get to see that as you walk by in the streets with fashion, you, you see it, you know, in a more extreme uh, version of that, because when you create a piece, people are wearing it and walking around with it and you get to, and it's just not one person. It's like a lot of people. Um, that will buy your piece and they'll walk around. Maybe you run into them at the mall. And for me, that that experience of just seeing something that I created be out there in the world and, and people 
uh, go out of their way to purchase it and wear it and uh, make it a part of their outfit. Um, it, it makes me happy and I, I love seeing it and it, it gives me that sort of feeling um, and I, I, I crave it. And even with the six prints, you know, sometimes I'll see stuff out there and be like, hey, I printed that, uh, you know, and but it, it does. It's not like uh, it's not the same because I didn't design it. I didn't create it. I just printed it. But you still sort of get that um, feel where you're like, oh, you're happy to see something that you, you know, you were part of the process, be it sort of out there. And um, that's really what gets me going, I think. Yeah. So um, is there any aspect of it that's like kind of physical? You mentioned you kind of liked engineering because you appreciated the aspect of, of building or creating things, right? Is mm -hmm. do you kind of get that when you're printing when you're at T six yeah, prints like yeah. like the the you physical do. aspect of it? Oh yeah, yeah. the The thing about screen printing is like it's like a it's a like a it's a beautiful harmony of like science and art. Um, the screen printing process and and you, you'd be familiar with this, you know, since you're into photography. Um, like I have an exposure unit, I have a dark room. Um, I have emulsion, I have photo emulsion, and that's how you make screens, right? You apply the emulsion, uh, you got to keep it in a dark room. I have film positives that we use to create the screens, and then we expose it under UV light, and then uh, we wash it out, um, and that's how you create the stencils. And let's say you have a six-color design in your artwork. Um, we separate each color into a different stencil. so. If your design has six colors, then we make six different screens, one for, let's say, the purple, one for the yellow, one for the blue. Um, and you print them one by one. Um, so you print the blue, you dry it a little bit, you print the purple, you dry it a little bit, you print. The, it's a very like time consuming process, but it's also very rewarding when you get the finished product at the end, when it's a really complicated print and you spent all this time creating all the stencils, making sure that the details were on point, making sure that all the colors are registered perfectly. Um, and then, you know, you go to print and you get your finished product. It's, 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 it's a really good feeling that you put all this work in and now you've created this physical object that you can look at. Um, it's it's yeah it's it's a very similar feeling to i think what a lot of maybe architects or engineers feel in a way like you put all this work in and um now you get to see your physical creation um and people get to experience it and people get to look at it people get to walk over it if it's a bridge all the time and it must feel good for them right and that's the sort of feeling that i i I'm, I'm attracted to. Yeah. And I mean, it probably doesn't feel as, uh, as bad as an architect might feel when that bridge collapses. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> walk me through, uh, one of your favorite designs. Cause, cause you, you not only screen print, but you, sometimes you create the designs for clients too, right? Um, not too much. Like I, I try not to, to get involved all too much mm, with okay. the, with the designs of my customers. Sometimes I'll help sort of lead them in a direction. Um, but ultimately it's their creation. Um, and you know, just based on my experience as a printer, I can sort of lead them in a direction where I think, you know, adding certain elements is better for their overall design because it just, it prints better. Um, but I, I like to stay out of their, you know, their creativity, if that makes sense. I don't really like to be too involved uh, only because I don't really want to be uh, involved. It's not really, um, if it's not something that I'm creating, that I, it's not something that I'm, you know, uh, I'm not really big into I guess, collaborations. So I, I try not to get involved um, and I let them do their own thing. 
Um, but I do so, help guide in a, in a way. Uh, yeah. So you're saying the uh, Imam X Ilchi collab not happening? Uh, no, no. I'm, oh, so, I'm really sorry to say it. I, <laughs> I had a couple of design mockups I wanted to show you during our interview, but that's fine. I'll just I'll put them away. That's but hey, funny. we could run the Barbara Ilchi. Uh, you know, just strictly you, and I could help you with the with the merch. All right. Well, something to consider then. <laughs> um, yeah. I got you. What about your own designs then? So, because um, if I'm remembering correctly, beyond Atlas Hoodie, um, you, you've created a few of your own stuff, right? I mean, the T6 Prince logo? Um, was that yeah, kind, kind of. Well, the, the new one, my new logo was created by uh, a guy in uh, Russia. Oh. Uh, he does like hand typography. And so... My initial uh, six prints logo, yes, I, I made it, but um, the my new logo was made by a Russian typographer, and you know he's very good at what he does, and he um, he hand sketched that logo. You know, it's not like an actual font. He literally created that from scratch, and it looks dope, and I love it. And you know, for me, like I, I know what my limitations are. I'm not. A, uh, I'm not like the best, you know, uh, sketcher in the world or best uh, graphic designers. Um, but I, I like to find people that could sort of bring the visions I have into to life. Um, yeah. So uh, I don't have, uh, other than that, less, I don't really have any design that I could really tell you that I, you know, like I do a lot of like stuff here and there, but I don't, uh, it's nothing significant, like even worth talking about. Um, but yeah. Are you, um, are you plugged into the kind of design fashion community where you are in Toronto? Kind of. Yeah. Kind of because I'm, um, you know, I print for a lot of the, the brands here and, right. um, um, other than that, I do like to keep up to date with some of the, the up and coming brands. Um, and I like to support them. Um, but at the same time, I'm not as involved as like someone who's like a true, uh, I'm not like, I, I, I like I said, I, I kind of live in my own world and I like it there. And I, I yeah. try not to get too involved with other people's uh, creative processes or their own creations. Um, but I do follow a lot of brands, um, for inspiration, um, especially the ones that are local. Uh, I love, I love to support the local ones for sure. Yeah. What are, what are some, uh, brands that speak to you? Um, one of the ones that I'm, uh, that I really like is, um, I guess these are not really local brands, but I, I like Eric Emanuel a lot. Um, he's a, he's a designer in based in New York. Um, and you know, his sort of, um, journey is something that I kind of aspire to be because he, he makes everything in New York. And, you know, for me, I want to make all my pieces in Toronto and I want to make them all in house. And so that's sort of, um, something that I, I, I really value and I, I look up to. Yeah. I mean, so Toronto is a big place and there's a big, you know, fashion community. So I'm sure mm -hmm. those local brands that you're working with, you know, serve as a, as an inspiration for the kind of stuff that you want to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 I'm inspired by a lot of the brands that I work with as well. Like the, you know, some of them start from nothing and then I, I get to be part of their growth and, see them grow into something bigger and, and it's it's amazing i love it so if if you were to give advice to a young young screen printer wannabe some some kid who only has a heat <laughs> press and a dozen gildan shirts you know what advice would you give them uh don't mess up <laughs> you know it's it's expensive <laughs> That would be the advice I give. But in our reality, I would just say, um, you know, just stay focused on what the bigger vision is and, 
and just keep going at it. A lot of times, you know, um, because I always envisioned, even when I was in my bedroom with a heat press and just printing away on Gildens, like you said, I always envisioned myself in a, in having my own space, um, having my own shop and my own employees and, um, and you know, it took time to get there, but it, it came true, right? So if you have visions of things that you want to achieve, um, it doesn't happen right away. But if you, you know, put the work in, it just, it's things just slowly fall into place. Um, I was watching a video yesterday on, uh, on my Instagram page. Like if you go on my Instagram and you go into the video section and one of the older videos is me giving a shop tour of my old, my first shop ever. And like in the video, it's, it's totally different than like what I have now. And in the video, you know, this was the beginning of COVID. And I was like, in the video, I was like, um, uh, I might need to downsize because, you know, COVID it's, I don't know what's going on. It's not, it's kind of slow right now. So I'm doing this tours, giving you guys a little tour of the shop. Cause you know, not much business yada yada and then to i was watching that yesterday i'm like wow like like to come from that to where i am now i never really expected it um but at the end of the day i stuck to it and then you know things just fell into place so yeah yeah is so would that would that be advice that you would give to yourself five years ago you know don't mess up don't mess up yeah yeah don't mess up um yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I think that would be the, uh, well, not the don't mess it, that was a joke, but uh, just that, you know, it takes time, I think, because I'm very impatient sometimes. Um, like, I, I need things to happen right away. Um, but I think patience is like the number one most important thing when it comes to building. Um, because you know you want to build a good solid foundation and then everything else is just just falls into place a lot easier when you have the foundation right um so i think that would be my advice is to just have patience and and, and if, you, if this is something that you really want to do and pursue then um yeah it also takes a little bit of passion too like you gotta love what you do right i was a super nerd about printing and every, you know, every waking moment was just, I, how do I do this? How do I do that? And even in my lectures, I'd be thinking about like printing and how do I solve this problem? Um, so it, it sort of envelops you when you really care and when you're passionate about it. Definitely. Um, I think that's great advice. You know, uh, you gotta keep your eyes on that, on the goal and, uh, Ride, yeah. ride the waves, ride the waves that come along. Uh, For sure. Yeah. Do you have any uh, closing thoughts, comments, remarks, or answers to questions that we didn't ask, but you think that we should have? Um, no, I think. Um, oh, no. I, I can sense an I don't know coming. I gotta, I gotta stop myself. Uh, uh, let's see. No, I think we covered pretty much everything. Um, I think one last thought that, you know, I do want to put out there only because I'm going through it is to not be afraid of changing, I guess. Um, like not be afraid of doing a completely complete 180 or not be afraid of completely starting from scratch. Um, and, you know, right now I've been trying to sort of uh, take myself out of the, the printing game slowly. And I want to completely start from scratch and sort of build a brand. And I want to do that now. And I don't want to do the printing that much anymore. But sort of, you sort of sometimes get, you know, suckered into this trap of thinking that because this is 
your business. This is something that you created. You have to stick to it and you have to see how it plays out to the very end. Um, I, I don't think that's true. I think, you know, if you feel like your passion, you've exhausted the extent of your passion for this particular thing, I think it's okay to make that shift into something else. Um, I don't think you have to necessarily stick to one thing because just because you have to, right? Um, I think that would just be my closing thoughts because um, that's something that I've been telling, trying to convince myself every day. That's um, sage advice, and I'm sure very timely for many people. Um, mm -hmm. It definitely made me think as well. So thank you for that, Subi. Um, now is the time for your plugs. Oh, yes. Follow me on Six Prints at T Six Prints on Instagram. And if you want to follow my personal page, it's Subi Mom uh, on Instagram. And yeah, that's that's the extent of my plugs. That's all I got. Nothing else. Uh, website? To, to plug. Website, uh, it's the sixprints.ca. Um, but if you go to the Instagram, the link is there. So, yeah, six. Um, just to clarify, six as in S I X. S I X. Yeah, not, not the, the number numeral. Six. Okay. No, no, I wasn't Perfect. that corny. I was a little bit corny, but not too corny. <laughs> Fair enough. Love it. Yeah. Um, thank you, Subi, for coming on and talking about this world of fashion, screen printing, and uh, enlightening us and giving us that sage advice at the end there. No, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. This is an honor. I'm an avid listener of your podcast. So it's, uh, it's good to be here. And it's good to have you. Thank you so much. Have a great uh, rest of your day. You as well. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening again. Make sure that you subscribe to Tarim Talks on whatever platform you're using and check out the tarimnetwork.com. We recently released the Uyghur Anthology, a collection of works from Uyghurs all around the world. So go to the tarimnetwork.com to check that out and subscribe to Tarim Talks to hear more podcasts. And once again, hope everyone has a great 2022.